Okay. Um, so yeah, so my name's Peter Knight and I'm going to kick off this talk. Um, and thank you very much for coming to listen to it, even though it's the last session, um, very long day. So thank you for coming here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about bridging the gap between data scientists and software engineers, really about deploying legacy Python algorithms into Spark and trying to make that as easy as possible. Um, and trying to give like a real world situation where we're not always on the latest tech stack and we're not, um, yeah, so hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, so like I said, my name is Peter Knight and I'm representing kind of data scientist. Um, I actually do use Spark quite a bit, but quite a lot of our data scientists don't or don't want to get into it. Um, and then uh, my colleague Lucas will hand over to him in a minute, um, who's a software engineer. Um, so a bit of an outline what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give a, one slide about what GA Aviation is, um, in case you haven't heard of us. Um, and then a bit of the problem we're facing um, with deploying algorithms. Um, and then I'll be handing over to Lucas to talk about an approach taken to solving some of these problems, go through a bit of code, um, because everyone likes a bit of code at a Spark Summit, and then talk about challenges and benefits of what we've done. So hopefully we can give you some conclusions and recommendations that you might be able to put into practice. Um, so yeah, so GE stands for General Electric. It's a large multinational company, has many divisions, one of which is aviation. Um, it has over 48,000 employees around the world, so there's a lot of people, um, and hundreds of data scientists and software engineers. Um, and um, a good way to get your head around the numbers really is, um, you know, our biggest area is commercial engines and pretty much every two seconds an aircraft powered by our engines is taking off somewhere in the world. So while I've been speaking, there's been quite a few taken off and probably some of you even flew here on one. Um, so just give an overview of the kind of general problem we're talking about. Um, like I mentioned, we've got hundreds of data scientists and engineers, various different skill levels developing um, algorithms. Um, but still today, most people develop their algorithms on their own computer, on their own laptops, um, local machines, maybe with sampled data. And despite us now having Spark infrastructure is available, um, getting people to transition or to learn new languages is pretty hard work. Um, however, Spark's a great candidate for us to deploy, and it's where we want to productionize algorithms. Um, so how do we make this transition easy? Um, we've certainly been encouraged by um, the announcement of um, koalas here, and hopefully that will help with some of these. Um, and so we'll have to think about how that interacts with what we're talking about here. Um, but to give a more specific example, one of the problems I'm currently working on at the moment is forecasting when aircraft engines should be removed for maintenance. And we want to do this so that we can plan, so we can know what engine parts will be needed, where they'll be needed, when they'll be needed. Um, and so to do that, engineers all over are working on different types of engines, looking at different parts, and for each of them, developing what we call digital twin models, so a digital representation of how that part might work or wear over time, um, and so that we can track it. Um, and this will be being done over tens of different engine lines, and each engine will have tens or even hundreds of parts that we want to track. Um, which means we've got hundreds or thousands of algorithms that we want to deploy or scale, some of which are already developed legacy things, some are in work at the moment, and there's obviously backlog of future things that people want to work on. Um, so we had a look at a bunch of legacy algorithms, and pretty much a lot of them still could be boiled down to some algorithm that took in a pandas data frame, did some magic with it, and then returned the results. And so what we've worked out is taking that as a, as a model for um, deploying algorithms. Um, and like I mentioned, um, with a lot of them, they're using pandas data frames, run on laptops, but they don't exploit Spark. Um, each one may be run independently um, and where they should perhaps be joined together. Each often fetch its own data, maybe used in CSV files in between. Um, we also have a mixture of other ones. So sort of real world's always a little bit messy, so not everyone's using Python. We have some legacy stuff that's actually being converted to MapReduce when that was around before we had Spark. 
Um, we have people developing in R, but we haven't really focused on that in this talk. Um, and so what happened with these algorithms is they were developed on small subsets of data, um, go through all kind of reviews that said they were great, but still when they went to be deployed and they were applied to a whole engine fleet, um, you got problems, um, which we don't want to happen. Um, okay. And as well as that, because each algorithm was written by somebody different in a different way without any standards, there's no real consistency there. Um, sometimes people would write functions, sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes there'd be global um, data sets that they're referencing. Um, perhaps even the same columns in the same data sets were being called different things or mapped. Um, people had all kinds of different ways of putting configuration. So if you wanted to do multiple runs across multiple algorithms, perhaps on a different date or with a different threshold, um, you had to edit config in different ways to make it run. Um, and one of the things we wanted to consider is that often we're trying to do a pipeline of things, not just a single algorithm. You want something that maybe curates your data, something that runs a number of different models. Um, and so we wanted to look into trying to make our algorithms more of a pipeline. Um, and we're quite keen on using things like Spark ML pipelines for, for modeling that. Um, and although we like them, we found in our organization, both data scientists and software engineers often don't consider this concept or certainly hadn't heard about um, Spark ML pipelines, which brings me to perhaps a good point in the talk to maybe get some interaction from you guys. So I wonder if you might put your hand up if you guys have used Spark ML pipelines much, because I'm not sure how much it's being used these days. Um, so I see maybe five, 10 hands. And, and of you guys, do you use that actively in production or it's just something that you maybe have played around in a demo or something like that? Um, yeah, it seems to be used a bit less in production. So we really like it because it gives a consistent wrapping for algorithms that we can deploy. Um, so I hope that's given you a bit of an um, insight into where we're at. And then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Lucas, who's gonna talk about kind of the solution side of what we've worked on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, so first, you know, we just wanted to take stock. What, what have we got here? We had a look at the legacy algorithms, the structure. Peter's told you a bit about them. How did they process the data? What columns did they require? How did they sort the data? Very importantly, did they have any tests? Some just tested little parts, so sort of sub-modules. Others did end-to-end -end tests, so the ones we started with, we wanted to have one so we could validate um, that they actually worked once they'd been ported. And a lot of them had these CSV files of inputs and CSV files of expected outputs, and we'll kind of come back to those later on. And because we were so told to get a lot of stuff working quickly, <laughs> we just assumed we didn't we couldn't alter the legacy code at all. So, um, you know, where, where you draw the line with this depends on, you know, what, what options are available to you. So basically, we, we had to wrap them. Uh, it wasn't an option to rewrite them in PySpark from scratch. But we wanted to make sure that, as Peter showed you, they all blew up when they tried to run against all the engines on one machine. We want to scale as the engine fleet grows across the Spark cluster. And if the fleet grows, we'll just make the Spark cluster bigger. So I just wanted to do an aside here is um, should you wrap or should you port a legacy algorithm? Um, so we've noticed a lot of people, especially they're new to Spark, they're excited, they want to learn it, and they're tasked with getting it running on uh, Spark. Their, so a, a lot of their immediate reaction is, let's rewrite it from scratch or PySpark. It's good for their CV and things like that. But it's not necessarily the best thing to do. So here's just some things to think about. So it might be a good idea to wrap it when you want to basically have the ability to opt out of Spark. And that might be because the original creator of the analytic just isn't interested in Spark, doesn't want to use it, and wants to test and run it locally on their laptop. Or we want to be able to support potentially other big data frameworks in future, heresy. Um, also, an auto code generation tool can be handy. The software engineers can come in and help uh, auto generate a lot of the boilerplate wrapping code. So 
that, that's a good argument for wrapping as well. However, you might be forced to rewrite it uh, from scratch if performance is critical and you want to leverage all of PySpark's goodies under the covers. And if the algorithms are small, simple, and easy to test, then, then rewriting it isn't such a big deal. And also, if the algorithm's creator is comfortable working directly with Spark. But even if that's true, you know, in the real world, people come and go and they leave. So you've got to think about, do you have a sort of baseline of Spark skills in your organization um, to support that algorithm for some time to come? So when we started, we originally looked at RDD map partitions. And what the idea was to repartition the input data by engine ID. And this worked. You probably might be thinking, why aren't you using data frames? But we'll, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but you can get unexpected key skew effects if several engines have too much data and will overload a partition. Uh, so you get this sort of um, laggard effect, you know, the slowest worker sort of thing. Um, it also assumes that because you're working on a partition, multiple engines can be assigned to the same partition. That's great if your algorithm can handle, you know, it's assumed to be able to work with the data for more than one asset, but it's no good if it can't. And really, we wanted to be able to use pandas UDFs. If you went to the sort of Python pandas tips talk earlier, you know, that's the recommendation. Sadly, in the real world, we're on an, a bit of an old cluster. We're only on Spark 2.2. So we can't use all the goodness of pandas UDF, uh, Apache Arrow, and things like that, which only came in from Spark 2.3. That's a shame. But really, what we wanted to do was um, use a paradigm that would be easy to port to Pandas UDF once, hopefully, it'll become available one day, touch wood. So then we switch to RDD group by key. And in this case, the key is the engine ID or the serial number. And that ensures that the data for only one asset gets passed to the algorithm. So coming back to, uh, Peter outlined the general sort of problem we're investigating, what, what we were applying this to. So we used ML pipelines. So we had an ML pipeline model which comprised all the components. And these are the main components. So we had these digital twin models. So each digital twin represents a single part in an engine. So you'd have one of these pipeline models for a, whole, a certain type of engine on the aircraft. And it would have multiple digital twins, one representing each critical part in that engine, which we're interested in modeling the wear of. And we want to predict the data uh, going into the future. That's where this input data predictor comes. So it would use historical data about environmental values, airports, and things visited by that engine to try and predict where it would go, and hence what kind of environmental conditions that would, engine would encounter into the future. So we try and predict uh, what, what it was going to do. And then you need an aggregator, because you're generating predictions for each part in that engine. So you've got to kind of look across all those parts and say, well, this one's going to fail early, or is predicted to fail earlier, or wear out beyond some critical level. So we want to be able to remove this engine for this reason, for that part. Okay. And then you typically want to persist results at various points in the pipeline. And as I said, we've made full use of ML pipeline transformers. Um, so they're great if you're in Scala, and it's kind of been backported to Spark. And again, we, we, we had this issue of how we save and load tra transformers, because basically we're having custom PySpark transformers. So one thing, as Peter mentioned, each Analytic just worked in its own little world. It would query, it would have an SQL query to fetch its data. Um, but we don't, you know, it's not the algorithm's responsibility to fetch the data, really. It shouldn't worry about where that data is hosted. The data should be passed directly to it. Um, one sort of staging approach we did was that, that thing for predicting the input data, that was still under development. So the way we sort of made it easier to handle was having a sort of staging table of sample input data, which was fixed. And that enabled us to uh, generate these digital twin models in parallel with that without uh, sort of changing under the covers. 
or as, as we were working. And we prototyped all of this in uh, Apache Zeppelin. We're not using uh, Databricks. And it's a nice, uh, it's a great environment for collaborating and prototyping stuff. But once, as our confidence in the approach grew, we uh, converted it into package, proper package Python code, which you could control using a Spark submit job. And we created a, we, as we started going through these algorithms, we spotted patterns, and that enabled us to create a hierarchy of classes to reuse the code, which I just want to talk about now. So here in green is the uh, classes you get for free by virtue of using, you know, at importing PySpark ML, whatever it is, you know, pipeline transformer or whatever. Um, so, but they're abstract classes. So what we wrote in this, these dark blue classes here is we made more specialized versions for our particular application. So engine wear models. And uh, Peter mentioned already we had to look at uh, supporting Hadoop as well. We managed to figure that out. Uh, but for using group by key, we had this other class uh, in the bottom left here. And then what would happen is for the wrapping of the algorithms, we would have to uh, each, each one would be uh, subclassed in its own concrete class for the digital twin for that part on that engine, those light blue bits there. So the aim was to make these light blue bits as simple and as easy as possible for the data scientists or the data engineers or whatever to wrap, um, you know, support their algorithm to make it work in Spark. And also, we had some mixing classes, because if you're familiar with the ML pipelines, a lot of the algorithms have output columns, features columns, and that enables you to say, when I have a particular transform, I want an output column, features column. Here we found it was typically, many of the algorithms had an ESN column, the asset, the engine serial number. They worked with date times, fleets, there's the operator, you know, whatever airline they're using. So you could just sprinkle these on top of your classes to, to, to use whichever ones you wanted. So now I want to focus on this uh, group by key engine wear model you know, down here. Um, so we've got some abstract methods up, up here, uh, the transform method uh, where the, all, the data frame containing all the data is passed in. Um, handling missing data. So each little wrapped algorithm might have its own way of dealing with missing data. Some of them could handle it and didn't need any special processing. We had this sort of processing input and, out and results columns as well. That was really just because, remember I said we couldn't alter the legacy code. That was to take our consistently named columns, and some because they, the no names were hard coded. That was just for renaming the columns before they went into the algorithm, <laughs> or for casting data types slightly. And the same is true for coming out. So now what I want to focus on is the um, is that 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 one class. So I'm going to walk through uh, those those three methods at the top. So first, looking at the transform. I'm sorry, this is a bit busy. Uh, but the, the main thing is I want you to see is, see these light blue things here? These are the columns that would have to, these are the methods that would have to be overridden in each of the uh, subclassed digital twin models, you know, to be filled in custom for that algorithm. But basically, you strip out uh, any null data first, because a lot of them didn't like that. Um, you rename columns as required. You get your asset column, which is the engine serial number here, and then you could just create this grouped key value RDD, where the key is the asset column or engine serial number, and the row is the actual data. You just get all your data, the values there, which are the rows of data, and then you call this run analytic for one asset, which I'll go into in more detail. I'll also come back to this fail fast thing as well. But the, you've got the results coming out here, which is an RDD. And you've got to convert that back into a Spark data frame, which we'll also go into. Uh, just tweak some column names. And then in common with the way uh, the transform methods work, you just join the results back onto the original data set. So as you go along the pipeline, each analytic adds its own results for each part. So here we've got the run analytic for one asset. I'll zoom in on the next slide. But the thing I, all I wanted to point out here was here's the magical bit where you jump from 
the Spark world into the Pandas data frame world. Um, remember Peter showed you before the input data going in was the Pandas data frame and what comes out is a Pandas data frame. So here it is zoomed in. Um, so here we're importing the actual Python module, which is the old legacy code. So each wrapped analytic, we gave it a module name, which has just told it the name of that file. We import it in. And remember, Peter said that it had an execute method, which took a pandas data frame. And then we just have, we, so we're taking in the asset data. So here at this point, remember, this is executing on the worker node. This will be the data uh, for a single engine, because we group by key. So it's a single, it's the, the data for a single asset or engine. So we convert it to a pandas data frame here, pass it into the execute method of the legacy code, and we get the results here, another pandas data frame, OK? Now here, to make it a bit more robust, so the problem with this is typically you'd run it on one or two engines, and you think, great, now let's run it on the entire data set. Bang, uh, you get an exception because there was grubby data somewhere, there's duplicates or nulls or... Yeah, there's the wrong data types and things like that. It was, a, it was a nightmare. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. So we tried to make it a bit more robust, and this is where the fail, flask, fail fast flag comes in. So the default behavior, which is good for debugging, is as soon as there's a problem, it'll just raise an exception, and the whole thing will grind to a halt. But the, the idea is, once in production, if you get bad data for a particular engine, instead of just killing the entire thing, We'll log an S, uh, a message, so this will appear in the executor logs, but we'll also trap it as a string and we'll return it instead of the pandas data frame. So if it works, results as a pandas data frame. If it fails and something goes wrong, you get, an engine, you get an error message back, and we help you find the needle in the haystack by telling you which asset, which engine serial number this is for, instead of just saying one of your 10,000 engines has failed for some reason. And now coming back to the third method, so you've got your results, which is you've got an RDD. And this RDD, if it all worked hummingly well, then it's an RDD of pandas data frames, one per engine. So first, you filter out anything that isn't a pandas data frame. Um, and those will be the strings for the engines that failed. So you just highlight them back on the driver here so you can see those. Um, and you filter out valid results, because in the nightmare scenario, you've got no pandas data frames at all. Nothing's worked, at which point you're screwed. You have to stop there. Um, so, but hopefully, you have got some valid results. And you can use this bit of magic, which converts them back into, uh, um, takes the pandas data frames and converts them back into raw lists, basically, of data. And now you can create a Spark data frame from that data, the RDD. And the really tricky bit here was how you specify the schema for the Spark data frame. And the kind of trick we use, this is all, all this code I've shown you is a kind of simplified version of the real thing. Um, but the, the key idea was to look at the schema for the first pandas data frame, pull out the first pandas data frame, get its schema, then create a data frame from that pandas data frame to get its schema, and then create a new Spark data frame from the original RDD of the results um, for, 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 that, uh, for all the engines using the schema there. Because if you didn't do this, you'd just get saying, you know, you got an int instead of a long or something like that. Uh, and we tried, this was quite challenging, this, and we, we tried different techniques. So I don't, I don't want to go into this in detail. This just compares the state, of, you know, how it was before we wrapped it and afterwards. Probably the key thing to bring out is one of the thing, features we like about ML pipelines is all the config is stored in the params. And you can save it to disk on the cluster you, you, know, you generated it and then reload it sometime later elsewhere. And it's got the params right there. I know you've, we've got ML flow now, but this is a nice way of storing the config directly with the model. Everything else I've been through there. But you know, it didn't all go sweetly. There were problems along the way, some of which I've already mentioned. So the first thing is, it wasn't really a simple. So the pipeline, you see it operating one analytic and then the other. 
So if you've got A going to B, that kind of implies that uh, B needs the results from A. But in reality, as, as Peter's saying, oh, the, the digital twin models are operating on separate parts in the engine. So they're really independent, and in, in an ideal world, they could be run concurrently. Um, and the, another problem is that in, in, in the paradigm here, all the data is fed in at the beginning, and it's not up, like, like I said, it's not up to each model to go and fetch its data. But sadly, some of them, quite a few of them actually, they required access to data that was in a different shape. It wasn't easy just to pull out the data you wanted and sort of munge it into a shape that would fit on as an extra column or columns on the original data going in. Um, so we allowed them to query data. We allowed them to part, take in uh, you know, query data from other, other sources. And as I've already mentioned, converting them, the, the pandas data frame results back into Spark data frames is challenging. And this is where something like koalas uh, could be really useful. Uh, debugging, I've already mentioned about the fail fast flag, uh, you know, uh, production uh, versus sort of staging. Uh, and, and, and of course, it's, it's divide and conquer. You start with one or two engines, and then you span, you span out you, to more engines, more fleets, as, you, as your confidence grows. Um, one thing that can be a bit annoying with uh, ML pipelines is there's a lot of boilerplate code. So when you create a param, there's a lot of uh, rubbish, basically, you have to write. A lot of boilerplate code around each parameter, and it can be pretty tedious. And this is where autocode um, generation would really help. And there's, as often there's quite common things, so you want to persist. Sometimes the shape of the data changes between the stages of the pipeline, and you want to persist the results to, to look at you know, what happens as you go along. Um, and you'd think that's a common thing, and it really ought to be bo uh, built into ML pipelines. It isn't, so we ended up having to write our own data uh, transformer whose job was just to persist data to some arbitrary location. So what are the benefits of this approach? Uh, we don't run out of memory anymore, no more of those bangs, because we're running across the cluster rather than all the engines on a single machine. Um, so yep, that we've got a whole pipeline model for each engine type. It's, a, it's just a nice, consistent framework for doing this. Uh, we've got consistent column names. Remember, we, we might have to tweak the column names going in and out. But at the high level, you've got the same names across all the algorithms. But the key benefit, really, is in a way, you can have your cake and eat it. Because remember, we said we're trying to bridge the gap between um, data scientists like working in their own little world uh, versus uh, Spark enthusiasts and things. And some of them want to work. They want to test their algorithm or iterate on it. Uh, on, you know, on their own laptop or whatever in their, in their own environment. But um, this way, we can let them carry on doing that if necessary. We encourage them to use Spark. Um, but their algorithm could be dropped in as is to scale with big data. So you don't, you know, you're not forced to rewrite it to use, to, you know, leverage the power of Spark. What could we, what we, what could we do next? I've already talked about the auto generation, the wrapper code, and that could be done in some kind of data science workbench UI. Because you can imagine saying, you know, say you want to create one of these, uh, you know, and run it in this removal forecast simulation scenario, then it will auto create all the necessary wrapper code depending on the target runtime you want to deploy your algorithm to. Um, here, I wanted to come back to those CSV files because don't throw them away. They're, they're, they're useful artifacts um, because it's a kind of a language or platform agnostic way of verifying your algorithm works. Because if, if you write a little test harness that can take those same CSV test files and to convert them into Spark data frames and pump them through your algorithms and then look at the results. You can compare them with the expected output data from those same CSV files, and you can verify the deployments worked. And of course, you'd want to switch to the Pandas UDF we talked about earlier. And we don't, I didn't know about, we didn't know about koalas until this summit, so we perhaps mentioned that as well. So, Ideally, you know, to let Spark do its magic, especially with you know, data frames and things, you want to 
defer actions to as late as possible in the pipeline. So in an ideal world, um, you want to persist intermediate results uh, uh, you know, as rarely as possible. Um, another thing is, unfortunately, many of these digital twin models, although they're written as algorithms, they're really a kind of a pipeline in their own right. So in, if you had the time, you can convert quite a few of these algorithms to a pipeline themselves of lower level algorithms. And what are currently appear as different algorithms for different parts could really be the same pipeline with just different configuration. And then, again, that's, that would really simplify things a lot in terms of code maintenance and understanding. So in conclusion, um, please don't just dive in thinking you must rewrite it in PySpark. There, there may be quite a few reasons why you want to keep them in a legacy Python, but wrap it to work inside Spark. We, we, we really like the ML pipeline thing, and I encourage you to have a look at that uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with that. And it borrows from the uh, scikit-learn pipelines. Uh, so if, the, if your algorithm can handle more than the data for more than one asset at a time, then you can use the RDD map partitions approach. And you know you could, we could have added that as an extra class on the class hierarchy, so you could switch between them if you wanted. But if your algorithm can only handle one asset at a time, then you, you have to use the RDD group by key. But that fits better with Pandas UDF anyway. And the class hierarchy makes it really useful for reusing code um, so that these uh, data scientists can concentrate on um, doing their data science stuff and, and, and don't have to waste time wrapping for deployment. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Peter. Um, so are there, are there any questions? OK. Hi. Uh, was this done in quite a kind of hand over to the software engineers, and they do their thing kind of a way? Was there much collaboration with the data scientists? Sorry, what was the question? How, did How they, much collaboration was there? Was there, so, was, there, was there much of a collaborative effort with the data scientists, or was it a bit kind of handover and the software engineers do it? And can you talk a bit about how that collaboration works? So it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So really, I mean, we're in the same team. Peter's a data scientist. Um, I'm a software engineer. But it's really a case of, if we go back to the slide with the bang, a lot of these legacy algorithms uh, were taking a long time to run, and they were often running out of memory because they were stupidly low reading the data for all engines in, into one machine. So we knew something had to be done, and um, so we needed, we, as, I guess there's an evangelist like us who are keen on Spark and could see that it you know, offered a, an approach for tackling this problem. Okay, I think just to add to that, I mean, I think in our group there's quite good collaboration between the two. I think across the whole of GE there's quite a lot of silos, and even within, say, software engineers, they have different expertise, and we have different platforms for deploying, and trying to get something unified across a large organization has been quite challenging. Thanks. Thanks for the question. We have another one over there. Uh, hi. I work in uh, wind electricity, and we are trying. We are in the beginning of uh, this long way, I guess. Uh, would you recommend uh, to persuade uh, the engineers to use the, the same formats, or you just? You, it seems like uh, you have written a lot of reports. I guess your data are also all in different formats in the beginning. All these column names. Uh, so uh, we went. We started by trying to unify the structure of the data and then persuade then trying to persuade our software engineers to use the structured by parquet files. Do you think it's a good approach or you recommend to leave the data in the original form? Um, so I can talk a little bit to that if I understand correctly. I think you were asking about consistency of data. Um, so there has been quite a lot of work in our organization to try and have um, multiple layers of data. So we've got completely raw 
schemas of data and then ones that are a bit more curated into a common format and then people are encouraged to use that. Um, but at the moment it's not enforced because sometimes you need the raw data because it's not being mapped correctly or whatever else. So uh, the aim is that we're trying to encourage people to use common data sets, but it's still a struggle to make those right. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, uh, it's just like from your perspective, is it a good investment of time <laughs> or should we just write the more reports? Well, we do want to, there's always this trade-off, isn't it? You could let the data scientists do their own thing, but then there's the trouble of how do you deploy it to production quickly? Because the business wants to iterate and try lots of different things and explore what-if scenarios. Um, so it's, it was always this tension between allowing the data scientists total freedom of tools and libraries and things versus ease of deployment. Um, and yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, we have another one. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I have two questions. One is technical and another is organizational, if I may. So the technical one is that, uh, as I understood, you uh, distribute your work to run multiple models, one in, on each node. What if you run out of the resources in that case also? In Spark setup, the workers cannot handle the data. That is my question first. And the second question is organizational. Where did you uh, find the lack of skills or the scarcity of skills uh, in the journey in data science, in software engineering, and in operations? So what was the ratio of uh, the workloads to achieve this and go even farther. Okay. Um, yeah, so to your first question, we're, the way we've coded this, it's parallelizing over the assets rather than the algorithms. So you're taking the data for, say, one engine or some algorithms, it's one aircraft or one subset of data, and that's what you're parallelizing over. So you're right, if one um, assets worth of data is more than you can fit on an executor, then you would still have memory problems. Um, but typically the data we're using with, once you've gone down to a single asset, it's relatively small amounts of data, um, you know, tens of thousands of rows, kind of order of magnitude. Um, and it's only when you're looking at um, 10,000 assets that that multiplies up to be too much. Um, I'm not sure if I got your organizational question exactly right. I think you're saying what's the kind of split of skills. Um, and yeah, I don't know numbers to hand, but we, we certainly have hundreds of data scientists, hundreds of data engineers, and um, we certainly have issues of silos of both ones being in different orgs and trying to have consistent approaches being a challenge. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Lucas. No, I don't think so. I mean, yeah, unfortunately, our organization looks like Ali Godsey's thing in his keynote speech where you know, it's a mess. So uh, tr trying to get people to follow a consistent vision is, is challenging in a big you know, global multi-country organization. Great. Thank you for the question. Are there any more questions? Okay, maybe maybe I have one. Uh, so, given that uh, with uh, Panda UDFs coming and maybe koalas, what do you think will change for for you and this wrapper approach in that area? Well, I think that may, we haven't had much time to think about it because I only learned about it yesterday. But I, I still see the real value is uh, converting to and um, well, it, it could simplify things quite a lot. Um, but I, I suspect the main thing would be the um, converting between data types and things. Uh, because that, that is a problem when you've got messy data. So hopefully they, they can handle that well you know, with the schemas and things. OK. And I get this question asked often. I think you did everything like in Python. I mean, probably also because that's the, probably the bridge, maybe also from data science and data engineering. So yeah, so what, what's kind of like also maybe the trade-offs? Is it worth investing in Python? Should I learn Scala? Should I be using R? What's it? I mean, I often get that question. What's your point on this? Well, um, very few, you know, except very, the vast majority know Python or R, you know, I use MATLAB before the data scientists. Um, 
only one or two real Spark enthusiasts got into Scala. And whilst, I mean, somebody else said it in another talk, whilst three years ago there was a good reason for using Scala for performance reasons, uh, I mean, I know we're still on an old version of Spark, um, but now with Pandas, UDF, and um, Arrow, and things like that, um, Python is what most data scientists use, certainly in our organization, and that's, that's what they'd prefer to work with. Uh, so it's, and that's another great thing about Koalas, is that it's Pandas-related API versus the more SQL-type API um, of just PySpark in general. OK, cool. Thank you. And one last, maybe. So skewed data, or if the key is, would be skewed and you're not able to partition that, wouldn't you need to also deal with that? Is that becoming a problem? Do you see that? Or is that sufficient right now for you? Um, well, we could handle it when we come to it, but it hasn't actually been a problem much yet, because <laughs> engines tend to last for a certain lifetime. Um, I guess more in future when you have so the more modern engines collect sen you know, sensor data at higher frequency, we might have to filter down or use uh, you know, vertical scaling with bigger size worker nodes and things like, like that. But we haven't had it so much as a, as a problem yet. Do, would you want to add anything to that, Pete? Yeah, I mean, we noticed it more when we were doing the map partitions because that seems to just distribute on um, the key. And you, some engines might have lots of data and some have few. When we're doing it by by the key, that seems to cue the jobs a little bit better. Um, but it still could be a problem there. But to date, it's you know compared to running a lot on one node, just distributing it makes it a lot faster and a lot better. So um, I think there's plenty of scope for improvement. But at the moment, it's below the radar of what we need for performance. Okay, yep. great. I think we have one last question, and then we need to wrap it up, actually. So, yeah, please. All right, thank you. Um, you've mentioned that um, you try to separate work between data scientists and uh, engineers by, because some uh, scientists don't want to learn Spark and stuff like that, and uh, you might have these wrappers and even uh, such cool stuff as koalas, uh, but this still leaves open room for such things as Q and all sort of, like, problems that you might face to? How do you separate the responsibilities of like um, optimizing these jobs? And do you think it's better to encourage the data scientists to learn PySpark because I think that um, will come sooner or later and then they have to dig uh, a bit lower anyways? Well, well that comes back to that uh, chart we had with the, the, the spectrum between wrapping versus porting. And it was deliberately shown as a spectrum because it's not a simple, it's, it's a bit of a subjective judgment um, about where, you know, whether to wrap or port. Um, yes, if I wanted to learn PySpark and things, I'd love to, my, my gut instinct would be to rewrite it. Um, but, you know, it's a trade-off between these different things. It, once, if you rewrite it in PySpark, you are locking yourself in to running on PySpark. Um, that assumes the person's got access, the data scientist has got access uh, to Spark easily to run it. Um, and he just may not, or he or she, just may not be familiar with it, uh, whereas they're used to testing it locally. So I, I don't think it's a hard and fast question. You've got to, you've, you've got to, you've got to look at your organization and look at the trade-offs you've got to make. You know, are you going to have Spark skills going forward? Um, how complicated is the algorithm? Is it going to take a long time to rewrite? So you could wrap it first as a quick way of getting it to scale. And if it looks like it's just not going to perform, then you, you would have to rewrite it or part of it. So I, don't I, just, I just also feel like if you do like separate this stuff because I'm just um, and even if you wrap it, or even if you try, decide to rewrite, there might be some duplication of work. Like you have to test it two separate times after you do this stuff, or like evaluate the algorithms if they develop on like subsample, and then you just fully merge it to Spark, and then be able to write it on the uh, to run it on the whole thing, and then you have to evaluate the model again. And look, you double all this effort. Um, so. Uh, do you, on, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you encourage your data scientists to go with Spark immediately, or do you not do it at all? Well, I think 
Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I think we want to encourage people to use Spark, and that's great, but it's the way they use it as well. You could still get your data scientists to use Spark, but write their algorithms in Python and either wrap it the way we've talked about it or wrap it using other techniques that have talked about so that the, the IP, the core technology, is still in an easily transferable um, format. Um, and using the approach we've done, you know, we're envisioning that wrapping being you know, an automatic behind the scenes kind of thing so they could test it themselves, deploy it themselves, that kind of thing, um, without necessarily having to learn Spark themselves, but have it run in Spark. And we're, the last thing I say really is we're just trying to lead by example. We're trying to attract them, pull them along with a carrot saying, look, Spark offers lots of nice things and tempt them rather than force them with a stick. Um, 